Hi everybody, it's Jay Nan, the San Antonio Metal Music Examiner, coming to you from Alamo City Music Hall. Later tonight, Coal Chamber, Fear Factory, Josta are hanging out and going to be rocking a big show tonight. And I have the pleasure of going into the pit with none other than Fear Factory guitarist, Mr. Dino Cazares. How are you? I'm great. Happy to be here. Love San Antonio. Love Texas in general. And we're on tour supporting our record, uh, Genexus. Comes out August 7th. So. And we're going to get into that. I want to ask you first, how, I know you guys had a day off on the tour here in town, yep. which is probably a rarity. How did you guys spend it? Um, yesterday we went to, obviously we went down to the Riverwalk. We had some food at the old Mexican restaurant, original Mexican restaurant. Uh, and we just had a few drinks and then uh, that was pretty much it. We stayed pretty much kicked back to the hotel, did some laundry. <laughs> you know, nothing too exciting. Um, you know, Life on the road. Yeah, he just said, you know, you, you got to get caught up on your laundry and stuff like that. So. You know, every day we're constantly doing stuff, so we just want to, sometimes it's good just to take a little breather and chill yeah. out. Well, I know you guys are a few days into the tour now, which is pretty much a contrast from the last time you guys were here at this venue when it was known as Backstage Live. Because in 2012, uh, it was the night that you guys kicked off the U.S. tour here. I don't know if you remember that, because no. I know all the shows are all run together. Yeah, they and not only did you kick off the U.S. tour here, but, and I remember this because I did a phoner with Burton back then. Um, and it was like three days after you guys had played in San Diego, Chile. That's, that's nothing. So you went from San Diego to... Well, it just fascinates me how bands do that all the time, going from one country to another. So you, so want, to know, you want to know where we were at all right. literally a day and a half before we started the tour. We Enlighten were, me, yes. We were, we were in Slovenia. Wow. We literally flew in from Slovenia. Uh, I think it was like a Tuesday. And then we had Wednesday off, left for tour on Thursday. Wow, so yeah. from Sylvania to San Diego to San Antonio, it's just... Well, it wasn't necessarily to San Antonio, it was, it was actually <laughs> Arizona, we started in Arizona. Okay. And this is like, I believe, our fourth show on the tour. Yeah. So, my... But I'm talking about in 2012. Oh, in 2012, yeah, I'm, 2012. I'm, I'm talking, talking about, about right now. now. Yeah, I'm talking about right now. As an example, Same just all Actually, Santiago yeah. was Chile is closer oh, geez. <laughs> than flying in from Slovenia. Wow. That's, that's a little further. That's, that's crazy. crazy out there. And so, uh, yeah, my... my um, I'm just a little off right now, you know, I'm a little tired, you know, the time difference, because right. we were in Europe for three weeks, and just, so it's when you sort of get acclimated to that time out in Europe, boom, you're right back in the U.S., you're like, ah, oh. you gotta try to, like, get back into the regular sleeping pattern. Yeah. Well, as Dino mentioned, Genexus, ninth studio album from Fear Factory, yeah. it's gonna hit you hard on August 7th. I have been giving myself a crash course for the last three or four days. You guys got some killer material, as always, on there. I love Soul Hacker. Uh, we, have three, yeah, we have three songs out right now. Are, yeah, Soul Hacker Regenerate. Uh, the title track are awesome, in my opinion. Since you already heard the I've record. got the whole album. Give, I got it three oh, days ago. Look, look so at I've you. Got the whole record. Look at you. So that's why I got to be prepared to Don't ask you questions it. about it. Don't leak it. Oh, of course not. I never give it up. Trust me. But I want to say, it's like I know a lot of people label you guys as industrial metal. I kind of want to call you guys autonomous metal. Maybe we'll start a new genre. There you go. It sounds even, kick ass. even better. It's another um, kick ass record. Tell me. Well, there Obviously, was, the industrial. There, there was no autonomous. There was no <laughs> automatons on this record. Automatons. On, on industrialists, there was. We used the drum program. Right. But on this one, we had a live drummer. Okay. We had Mike Keller. Mm -hmm. And he's been with us for three years. And so he's, he's an amazing drummer. So we decided, hey, let's, let's bring in a live drummer. Yeah. And so we kind of wanted a, a hybrid element on this record. Um, you know, obviously we had a lot of live drums, but then you know, we were able to do a little bit of the sound replacement on the drums to give it to, 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 to use more of an electronic sound and a live sound and blend it together. And we, we thought that that hybrid was perfect. And we had a guy named Andy Steen mix the album, and he's really good yeah. as far as using, using organic tones. And so that's kind of like what we wanted to go for on this record. And, and uh, we also brought a lot of the groove element back because you know, on some of the last record, like Mechanized, it's just all ripping fast. Industrialists had a lot of rippers too. This one has a lot of rippers. You heard the record, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of big groove on this record. You know, like songs like Soul Hacker, Anodized, mm -hmm. big, big groove one. Uh, Church of Execution, right. another groove track. Um, then you got the classic songs like Dielectric that reminisce, right. uh, 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 you know, like some of the older material, like, uh, you know, D Manufacturer album. We have the song Genexus, which is just right. killer song. another ripper. And a regeneration. You know, yes. Proto Mex, you know. Uh, um, but then we have, you know, the last song, which is called Exploration Date, which is something completely right. different. 
We always put these really big, epic Outro. songs at yeah. the end. Yeah. I was ask you about that, yeah. Because, you know, we just think it's the perfect place. You know, we've always, like, came out with a hard hitter in the beginning. The opening, the opening tracks always got to be hard hitting. Right. And then we ended up with something a little bit more softer. And just, just to bring you down from all the chaos that goes on, you know, in, in the first, you know, uh, three quarters of the record. And at the end, it kind of, like, you know, goes like this. Right. Smell us out. Right. Well, because the album isn't out yet, can we ex are we can we expect any new material tonight or a mixture? Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, we've been playing a combination of songs. We've been doing a uh, Soul Hacker, Dialectic, and Proto Mac. We've kind of been switching between all those. All those. Uh, but tonight, for sure, it'll be Dialectic and, and uh, Soul Hacker. Sweet. So, those two songs for sure. When we were in Europe, we were just doing um, Soul Hacker and we were doing Proto Mac a lot. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, trying to get people broken into the songs. Everybody pretty much knows Soul Hacker because that was the first track that came out and that's been out for you know a few weeks now. So a lot of people know that song. But uh, the other songs are still starting to marinate. People are still starting to get into them. Right. So it's really cool. People seem to be really excited about the album. I mean, once they heard the songs, you know, Soul Hacker had a little bit of a slow, it was weird. Soul Hacker had a little bit of a slow start when it came out. It was kind of like this, people were like, I don't know. Then all of a sudden, for some reason, it just <laughs> skyrocketed. And it's like, wow, it's, it's going to try to be a hit. Yeah. Well, besides the, the, the real live drums and versus the programming, The Industrialist was pretty much a concept album. It seems like, you know, the last couple of albums have gone through that whole science fiction, man versus robot type of theme. Well, not necessarily versus on this record. Yeah, that's why I was going to ask you, what's the major difference with this? Because this isn't known as a concept record, but it has some of that feel. Well, it's known, it actually is known as a concept record. And it, is, it is a concept album. And basically, it's the singularity process where man and machine have become one. So is it a continuation of the industrialist story? It's a, continu All right. it's, it's a different story, but it, it does, it goes to the next level. Okay. Right? And this is basically, uh, it, it showed, like, for instance, autonomous combat system talks about how it's used for military purposes. You know what I mean? The first um, song on the album. Yeah, yeah the first song on the album. And then it kind of goes into anodize. And anodize is actually, it's a certain coating that you put on metal, mm -hmm. a certain metal, to protect you, protect the metal from certain things. So this is actually a coating of, that goes on to the exoskeleton, you know, of the, um, of the automaton. So yeah. it's, it's a coating that goes on it. Yeah. So it makes it strong, you know, it's like unbreakable, shit like that. I've always wanted to ask you, Dino, what, what do you feel is the, if you had to pick a singular aspect of what Fear Factory sound is, is known for? Is it the drum programming? Is it Burton's melodic vocals? Is it the guitars? I know it's probably a combination, obviously, but if there's one thing that sticks out and you think in the public's mind, when they hear Fear Factory, oh, it's because of this. What do you think sticks out the most? Well, I think the first thing that sticks out the most is like, for instance, like a, an album like Demanufacturer. You hear the drums right away. It starts off with drums. So it's like, wow, okay, that sound. Like, wow, I never heard drums mixed or sound like that before. Wow, that's fucking amazing. All of a sudden, boom, you get the guitar that comes in. And it's like, whoa, it's syncopated with the drums. And then all of a sudden, Bert's vocals come in, and you're like, okay, I heard some vocals like that before. Then all of a sudden, the big, beautiful, melodic chorus comes in, and you're like, holy shit, this is different. <laughs> so I think it's a mixture of everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's the preciseness of the playing. You know, when we first started out, we didn't have the technology, you know, back in the early 90s. Actually, 1990s when we started. We didn't have, you know, we couldn't afford computers. We couldn't afford samplers. We couldn't afford any of that stuff, so we tried to copy it, but playing it. Right. Like, for instance, if somebody got a riff, and they sampled the riff, and then you hit the key, and it goes, let's pick any riff, whatever. Um, let's say South by the Sister. It's just a constant loop, right? So we, we me and the drummer, we just sort of playing it that way. Stop, start thing. Trying to trying to imitate the machine, and that's how we develop our music style. Mm -hmm. Then, on top of that, you had the, you had the aggressive vocals. Then you had these beautiful melodic choruses. Boom! That that's what pretty much made Fear Factory, yeah. and it's still a staple of music today. One of the main things that you really hear 
is for its vocal style. I mean, you know, if you would have copywritten that thing back in 1990, he would have been pretty rich by now because every fucking band does it. Every band has experimented with it. Every band, you know, still do it. There's bands who don't even know where it came from, and they're being influenced by other bands that did it, and and so on and so on and so on and so on. It's just so it's become a staple of music today. So I asked Burton this question when I talked to him on the phone two years ago. I want to get your version now. Is it true? I know you guys started out as roommates even before Fear Factory um, formed back in the day. Is it true that he actually joined on board as a singer because you heard him singing a U2 song in the shower? Okay, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> well, we had, when, me, when I moved into this house, there was, there was a house in Hollywood that was a seven bedroom house, eight, eight bedroom house, it was eight bedrooms. And every, every room was rented out to different artists, okay. right? And I happened to be one of the guys who was living in one of the rooms upstairs, where it was downstairs. I hadn't even met him yet. That's how big this house was. So I walked downstairs and I heard somebody singing to you two in the shower. I'm like, who is that guy singing? That like, sounds amazing. And then, so obviously we met and we ended up starting a band together, but it wasn't Fear Factory, it was a band called Alceration. Alceration, which became Fear Factory. But that's how it all started. And then, when we started Alceration, he wasn't singing melodic, he was singing brutal. Because I asked him, can you sing heavy tune? He's like, yeah. Bro. So we, we did this band, bro. and then all of a sudden, one day at rehearsal, he's like, bro. I'm like, wait, what was that? <laughs> yeah, that's what you did in the shower. That's fucked. Yeah, do that again. Really? You want me to do it again? I'm like, do it again. It's just the combination. We knew that we had something. We knew it. Like, we need to really, you know, capitalize on this. So obviously the early demos, you know, we got better and better and better. You know, it was kind of hard to go back and forth. It's not easy to do that. You know, and um, so we did it on the first record, and it was cool. But like after doing all the touring from the first record, when we went into D manufacture, Burt really practiced it, and you know really got it down yeah. to where to where D manufacture really pretty much we honed in on on our craft and what we wanted to do. We focused on it, and then boom, it just it came out as a masterpiece, pretty much. Proving that the idea of riffs, the slightest inspiration vocally or whatever, can emanate from the strangest of places in the shower. You heard. Yeah. That's great. Do you remember what U2 song it was? Um, I think it was Sunday Blood Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Sunday Blood Sunday. Um, and then we didn't have any guitar solos on our, on our record either. And that kind of came from, you know, industrial bands that didn't have guitar solos, uh, early grindcore bands that didn't have guitar solos. And then I was like, guitar solos were so overdone at that point. Back in the... In the 80s, it was all about the solo. You had, you know, in the 70s, you had the eruption, and every dude yeah. was just shredding, like just shredding. It could have been a glam metal band, but all of a sudden, you know, you had some guy shredding. Like, yeah, you know, let's write music that didn't have that. And so that's what we did. We more focused on the riffs, we focused on the vocals, we focused on the sound, the tones, and we focused about on being really tight, precise, and. Um, so we just kind of put the solos aside. We never wrote parts for solos. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about which. Hold on, which started a whole trend as well. Yeah. Bands like you know Deftones and uh, all the new metal bands that do solos for a long time. Cool. I wanted to ask you about the addition recently of Tony Campos on bass. Of course, you know him from his Static X days, uh, Soulfly. I caught him last month on stage with Ministry. Um, I know he's no stranger. He's no stranger to you because he was in Asesino with you. Yeah. Um, what? Does he bring to the band on bass that may, in Fear Factory that maybe you never had before? Oof. See, I don't want to insult the other bass players that we had because they've all been great. And they've all been, you know, something different. Where I think Tony was very natural. Because obviously he's been playing with me. He knows my style really well. I didn't have to sit there and teach him like my pinky style. Because right? he's already in a band with me called Asesino. Because, you know, I have a. I feel that I have a very distinct picking style and the way I write, you know what I mean? And some bass players that have joined the band have had to learn it, you know what I mean? Sit there and learn it, practice it, really, 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 really do it, you know? Whereas Tony was like, yeah, I know it. You know, he's been playing with me for so long, right. so. And plus, you know, we've known each other 
for 20 years or so, maybe longer, 20 some years. And you know, he started out in the backyard scene like we did in LA. You know, there was no outlet for us to play heavy music, so we had to do our own parties, backyard parties, we call them. And uh, um, you know, like keggers, man, it's gonna play. It's kind of like that. And um, so we knew each other from way back then. And um, and then over the years, obviously, he started Static X. We took him on their first tour, Fear Factory did. And then um, we obviously we did Asesino together, and Tony's been in like every band, Ministry, Soulfly, Prong, Static X. Um, and it was cool because when we got Tony, I was basically just a phone call. Hey man, you want to join? Yeah, okay, cool. You're in. You're in. It was like that easy. Like I know I didn't have to teach him the songs. I know I didn't have to do any of that stuff. You know, he basically learned everything on his own, and we were actually starting our touring cycle and he was still on tour with Ministry. So the first show that he played with us was a place called, it was in, it was in Canada, it was called the Amnesia Rock Fest, right? Ministry was playing the night before, we were playing the day after. No rehearsals with Tony, no nothing, no sitting down with him, having to teach him any songs, nothing. We fly in, we get there, boom, we, we just play the show and Tony did everything perfectly. Awesome. Didn't have to teach him nothing. It was just easy. We'll wrap this up by asking you. You've mentioned Demanufacture, of course. It's got to be very exciting that while you have a new album coming out, you're also celebrating 20 years of that incredible album. Yep. I know, I believe you guys are playing the whole thing in Europe later this year. Yep. Um, what's the one thing or two things, whatever, that sticks out the most in your mind from that album? Um, it, was a, it was a very long process to make the album. We. Uh, there was a lot of hurdles that we had to go through to, to complete the record. The writing process was pretty easy, you know. Uh, we wrote it pretty fast, but we ended up, uh, before we went to go record, we ended up doing a tour with Sepultura. So we did a tour with Sepultura, we came back, okay, we gotta, we gotta go record this record. So we hired this producer named Colin Richardson, which a lot of people know. He's a Carcass, Machine Head, Napalm, Brazilian bands, uh, Shrivium. Um, so we hired him to do this record, and then in the middle of the record, we weren't seeing eye to eye on production. Mm -hmm. So we ended up having to fire him, right? So that's kind of a, it's kind of a scary process because remember we're still young. Right. We didn't really, we didn't really know how everything worked, you know, in, in business wise like that. But we needed to get rid of him. We knew that, and so we got rid of him. We hired this guy named Greg Reilly and Reese Fulber. They came in. They saw the same vision that we did, and they pretty much came in and saved the album. So in that whole long process, it was about a six-month process, and you know, firing guys, getting the next guys to come in, finding studios, f flying. You know, back then they had two-inch tapes, big tapes. You had to fly those in all over from Europe back to the states. Blah blah. blah. The next thing you know, we spent one hundred thirty thousand dollars to make the record, which was a lot back then for us. It was a lot. Luckily, we had a guy named Monty Connor who worked at Order of Records. Yeah, really believed in the band. He's like, whatever it takes, let's just get it done. And boom, it's a classic record. Yeah. Awesome. Well, there you have it. Fear Factory on tour with Cold Chamber and Josta right now. And I know in a month from now, Fear Factory is going to be headlining with Once Human before the morning, uh, the Bloodline, I believe. Well, that's coming back to say. Right, I know. That's coming August 27th to Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi, the House exactly. of Rock. House so of Rock. Check them out on tour. I had the pleasure of covering you guys on the first 70,000 tons of metal cruise in 2011. Wow, yeah. And last October at Knotfest. Yes. Just tonight will be my first chance seeing you here, actually, in San Antonio, because I wasn't able to make the show a couple years ago. So, Dino, thank you so much for taking the time. Pleasure thank to talk to you. Best of luck with everything. I have some other news, too. Break it. And then I'll tell you yes. now. Um, we are planning to do something next year for the 20-year anniversary of, of tea manufacturing here in the States. Awesome. So, it could be a tour, it could be you know, a handful of shows, we'll, we'll let you know. So keep an eye out for that because, you know, it basically came out in June of 1995. So we got a whole year to celebrate it. It's awesome. So we're going to do it before the year's up. Great stuff to look forward to with Fear Factory. Go check out them on tour. Go pick up Genexus coming out August 7th. So once again, for Dino, it's Jane on to San Antonio, Metal Music Examiner, saying don't hang them out to dry. Thank you. Hold them up high.